and God and a place where you have served Christ in a variety of ways. Anniversaries often bring back all of those memories. And just like an anniversary, when we come together each week for communion, we do it to remember something significant, far more significant than any other anniversary that we reflect on. Jesus himself said to participate in communion in remembrance of him. And Daphne's already highlighted this morning that remembrance is an important aspect of Christianity. As believers, we are encouraged and strengthened by remembering the deeds of those who have gone before us. We remember that ours is an ancient faith. We remember the promises of God's word And as we do so, our confidence is built in trusting God and living in his truth. There are several places in scripture where we are encouraged to remember. But the commandment from Jesus spoken on the night he was betrayed stands out from the rest. There is a deep and vibrant meaning to this instruction And this remembrance continues to be a cornerstone of our faith. Luke 22, verse 19 and 20 says, And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The Jewish people had observed the Passover meal every year in order to remember God's fulfillment of the promise. Every year they reenacted the preparation of fleeing Egypt and being prepared for whatever came next. Well, Jesus takes this concept to its completion as he reveals that he is the fulfilment of the Passover. Here we see Jesus commemorating, observing observing and remembering what God has done while simultaneously revealing what God is doing and will do. Just as the blood of the lamb covered the doorposts in the original Passover, the blood of Jesus covers our sins. As we remember freedom from physical slavery in Egypt, we also remember the sacrifice of Jesus that frees us from spiritual slavery. In John 6, 56, Jesus says something strange that makes no no sense at all when it's taken out of context. He says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Strange. In that moment, these words caused many people to turn away from him, but we can now clearly see what he was referring to. It was the fulfilment of the Passover meal in his life, in his sacrifice, and in his resurrection. As we observe communion today, we are declaring ourselves to be in community with him and with one another. So if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour and want to be in community with him, then you're welcome to participate. As I pray this morning, please take the bread, the little wafer that represents Jesus' body, given for you and I. He tells us to eat it in remembrance of him. Let me pray. Jesus, we declare you Lord of our lives. Thank you for the love, your love for us. We partake in communion now in remembrance of your sacrificial love for us. God, we are so far from perfect, but we're sorry for all the ways we mess up. We ask that you remove our sins. And thank you that you restore us into relationship with you. Amen. 
the juice uh, represents the new promise that Jesus sealed shortly after he shared the Passover meal with his friends. A promise sealed with his own blood when he was crucified on a cross. The promise of grace, forgiveness, restoration, direct relationship with God, eternal life. All through the power of the blood of Jesus. Let's drink the juice together. Thank you, Jesus, that we are no longer slaves to sin because you have set us free. We also thank you for your blessing on our lives and the resources available to us. 100% of everything we have is yours, and we pray that you bless the tithes and offerings that have been presented to your church. We pray that they are used to honour and glorify you and bring more people into relationship with you, Jesus. Amen. Well, let me change focus a little bit now and uh, bring you a few announcements. This morning, as we've already said, happy anniversary. It's great to have you all here with us this morning and a special welcome to you. If you're a visitor here today, we'd love to catch up and connect with you. Um, this morning, to help us with our celebration, we'll be enjoying a special morning tea after the service. That's available just out the front, so please participate in that. Go and grab yourselves some cake and a refreshment, and then either hang out in the coffee shop or come back into the auditorium so that you can connect with friends and hopefully someone that you haven't uh, met before or spent much time with before as well. Also, as you leave this morning, we have show bags. There are show bags for adults, so please make sure that you get one of them on your way out. And there are show bags for kids as well, so you can choose which one uh, fits your liking. Coming up this Saturday, there is a family barbecue that's happening to celebrate the end of the school term. It's going to be held at Gels Park at 11am in the morning. This is for families who are involved in rock kids, mainly music, uh, and mops as well. So please come along to that. Please let Megan know your availability to attend today so that that will help her with planning. If you're not involved in one of those three groups that I listed, but you have a neighbour um, with children, or you might have your own grandchildren um, that might want to participate during the school holidays, please let Megan know too. You're more than welcome to attend and connect in with some of those groups. Love to see you there. On October the 1st, we are planning a combined service with our Mandarin-speaking congregation who are currently in Hall 2, um, praising and worshipping at the same time as us. So come along to that. Um, praise and worship together in multiple languages. Um, hear from a guest speaker. We're also hoping that there might be some baptisms that morning um, and some also some cultural um, dance and praise and worship as well. If when I said the word baptism, something jumped inside of you, I'll go as far as to say maybe that was the Holy Spirit prompting you. If you haven't been baptised, this might be your chance to do it with a group of other people on an amazing morning in just a few weeks' time. So please consider that too and uh, speak to one of the elders if you'd like to be involved in that. Can I ask you to save the date on the 5th of November, please? That's for our AGM. Um, We'll, we'll meet for that AGM immediately following the service and we'll try and keep it um, fairly succinct uh, on that morning too so that you can get away for lunch. I'll skip back to the last one. I think I skipped over highlighting the fact that we're having lunch on the 1st of October as well and there now are details about that. So you'll get an email this week on how you can book that in. Um, otherwise, you can take a snapshot of that QR code right now. Really affordable for everyone. You could even pay for yourself and a friend who doesn't attend our church, and it will cost you less than a meal um, outside of the church. So pretty good, given inflation. Get involved in that. Last week, um, we informed you of two significant um, things that are happening in the church. The first one is that Amanda Liu has been uh, nominated to become an elder of our church. And as part of the church's process for the appointment of elders, we're now giving a month for people um, to collectively discern that nomination, to pray about it, to chat with Amanda, and then give feedback to the elders, positive or negative, whatever it is that you might want to share 
um, with the elders. Um, all going well. Amanda will be appointed um, as an elder next month, but really encourage you to engage in that process. And if you want to read more about it, we've pinned um, that information on the notice board at the back, and you can also get a copy um, from the office or in digital form. The other significant announcement last week was that we announced that we had received a formal notice of intention to acquire from the Department of Transport and Planning. They are planning to take um, the th our property, the three blocks that we own here. And this is the first step in the formal acquisition process. And there are a couple of steps that will follow on this one, namely that the Rail Loop Authority will determine a fair and reasonable compensation package and they'll present that to us for our consideration and we'll begin the negotiation on that. And then the authority will publish in the Victoria Government Gazette a notice of acquisition when they formally acquire the property. Um, and that'll happen between two and six months from now, we're told. As I mentioned last week, this doesn't mean that we'll be instantly displaced from this property. The government proposes to take possession of the land on the 1st of August 2025, so just less than two years away. And we will provide more information as soon as possible on that one. With receiving that update um, and the notice of the intention to acquire last week, we had prayer at the end of our service. Um, particularly for our church, and we, we encouraged everyone to answer two questions. The first one being, or statements, we said, we praise you God for, and Lord, position Monash City Church of Christ to be. And we really want to encourage everyone to continue to add to the prayer board this week. So that's available at the back of the auditorium. You can fill out the paper copies, write on your response to those two prompts, and then they'll all be put into the digital uh, board that you saw up on the screen last week. It'll be circulated with everyone. So you can see kind of where the heart of the church and everybody in it is at. And then we can be very prayerful about those things uh, going forward. So please get on board with that and participate today. One final announcement. Yes, final announcement. Um, it is September again. You all know about Safe Water September. It's a great initiative from Global Mission Partners where participants only drink water for the month of September with the aim of raising funds um, to share it with places that need clean water and promote sanitisation. Um, I know of one person in our church who's participating at the moment. That's Peter Broadbent. And if there are other people that are involved, please let me know so that I can promote you too. But we do want to um, give generously to this cause. So if you would like to, speak to Peter about how you can support him. He's looking really well hydrated this moment. Your, your skin's looking fresher and cleaner too. You look younger. <laughs> Cut out all the coffee and Cokes. Good. So there's double benefits to all of this. Um, if you'd like to speak Porter, Peter or the cause, <laughs> Porter. <laughs> then um, please speak to him, or also there's a QR code that will be on the notice board as well this morning. Thanks for your patience and listening. Josiah, come on up. You're going to bring us the reading this morning. Yep, come on up. Don't be shy. And then Anthony's going to share um, part three of our series, The Kingdom, with us. The parable of the mustard seed and the yeast. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so, the, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked through all the dough. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mark 4.30, the parable of the mustard seed. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of heaven is like? Or what, the parable, shall, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is 
the smallest seed you can plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. With such big, with such big branches that the birds with the that the birds of the air may can perch in its shade. Luke twelve eighteen, the parable of the mustard seed and the yeast. Then Jesus said, What is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air perched in its branches. Again he said, what shall I compare the kingdom of king, what kingdom of God to? It is like a yeast that woman that, that a woman took and makes into a large amount of flour until it worked through all the dough. Thanks, Josiah. Sorry, I had to send you around the different gospels. <laughs> Okay, good morning church. I'm just gonna, hi, okay. I'm just gonna get set up here, sorry. Thank you. Okay, there we go. All right, so I, I'm Anthony. Um, I have the privilege of bringing you the third talk in this series today. Um, and so uh, before we begin, um, just let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather here today to explore your word and seek your wisdom, I ask for your presence to fill this place. Open our hearts and minds to receive the message you have prepared for us. May your Holy Spirit soften our hearts, guide our thoughts and our understanding as we reflect on your word. May your truth resonate within each of us, inspiring us to live according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, in the introduction to our series, we learned from. Oh, it's fine, sorry. So, oh, yeah, 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 that's fine. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. So in the introduction to the series, um, on the next slide. Yep, okay. All good? Okay, all right. Um, so on the first slide, um, in the introduction to the series, we learned from Xu Feng um, that there is no single definition that can succinctly capture the nature of the kingdom of God in a single sentence. We learned that Jesus is the king of the kingdom, and we learned that uh, some of the signs of this kingdom would include healing, transformation, hope, and eternal life. And although the path will be difficult, 
we have all been called to imitate Christ's selflessness. And then uh, Elaine brought us the message of the weeds and the wheat, or the darnel, and how they can both appear very similar up until the point of harvest. Now, um, she also reminded us that the kingdom is both already and not yet, and how God will eventually separate the weeds from the wheat. But we are also reminded that we, as followers of Jesus, have to look forward to an age where there is a new heaven and a new earth, when God's dwelling place will be among his people. This week, we will reflect upon Jesus um, and how he used the, na- the analogy of the mustard seed to describe the kingdom of God in several parables. Most notably, as we heard this morning from Josiah, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, and the Gospel of Luke. The mustard seed analogy is used to convey several important spiritual lessons and insights about the nature of God's kingdom. And here are some key points that we will cover today. Small beginnings and remarkable growth, faith and trust, church and community. There we go. And another one. There we go. All right. Last one. (laughs) Hey. Okay. All right. So, why the mustard seed then? Um, As we know, Jesus frequently used parables to teach profound spiritual truths. And And in the mustard seed parable, Jesus used familiar agricultural imagery appropriate for the time, making it easier for the audience to relate and understand what he was preaching. Reading the passages, you might be thinking, surely the mustard seed is not the smallest of all seeds. I've seen smaller seeds than that. But remember that Jesus was not speaking in absolute terms, such as a biologist might, but in the frame of reference of a normal experience in Jewish agriculture at the time. Mustard seeds were the smallest seeds to be commonly planted in Palestinian fields at the time. Reading further in various commentaries, there have also been remarks that the mustard seed doesn't typically become a tree, but that also depends on what kind of mustard we're actually dealing with. Uh, In first century world, looking at the original language and how Jesus' parable was recorded. The Greek word for the mustard seed in the Gospel of Matthew is the Greek word sinapi. And sinapi is a general word for mustard. Some scholars believe it is a catch-all term for similar flora too. So let's have a look at the options available to us. They are two primary options as to what mustard seed Jesus was referring to at the time. But regardless if it's the first or the second, it doesn't change the point of the parable and why Jesus used the mustard seed as an example. The first option is known as the brassica nigra or the black mustard plant. Ironically, the petals are yellow, but the seeds are black. And here is what it looks like in the springtime. In Galilee as a whole, mustard is everywhere in the springtime and particularly it grows up rather tall, around about two and a half meters at most, and it can engulf the countryside as you can clearly see here. Option two is the Nicotiana glauca. The Nicotiana glauca is well known by its more common name, tree tobacco. It is also referred to as the mustard tree, and it looks, well, rather different um, than the black mustard since it looks more like a tree. Um, Growing up to seven meters tall, it has yellow tubular flowers, about five centimeters long, about one centimeter wide. And if you pluck the bright yellow pods from the tree, break them open and pop them onto your hand, you'll see several of these tiny seeds with each one having the potential to grow into that rather large tree. Now, this is what everyone would have known in Jesus' day. 
Whether it's option one, the Brassica nigra, which is very small seeds, about one millimeter in size, and can engulf the hillside given the right conditions, or option two, the Nicotiana glauca, with incredibly small or minuscule sized seeds that each has the capacity to grow into that seven meter tall tree. What makes the mustard seed so outstanding then is its massive capacity for growth. This is why Jesus referred to it as the smallest of all seeds. Is it the smallest of all seeds on earth? No, but from a proverbial perspective, it is the smallest of all seeds that have the capacity to turn into this great tree. Now, Klein Snodgrass um, is a widely renowned American theologian and author who served as professor in, in New Testament studies at North Park Theological Seminary in Chicago, Illinois. And in his publication, Stories with Intent, a comprehensive guide to the parables of Jesus, he writes, in both Jew Jewish and Greco-Roman uh, worlds, mustard seeds were proverbially known for their small size, even though other seeds, such as the orchid or the cypress, were known to be smaller. But since we are dealing with a proverbial use, anxiety issues um, of accuracy are out of bounds. And so, one of the primary messages of the mustard seed analogy um, is that even though the mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds, it grows up into one of the largest plants among garden herbs. Similarly, the kingdom of God starts small, but will eventually grow into something remarkable. This illustrates that the impact and influence of God's kingdom can begin with something seemingly insignificant. For example, starting with a carpenter, a carpenter's son sorry, from Nazareth, a bunch of fishermen, a zealot, and a tax collector. And that can expand and spread significantly over time. Again, for example, forming a church spanning across the world with one of the most published and translated books of all time. And yet, we are reminded, both last week and the week before, that the kingdom of God is already and not yet. Just as with the mustard seed, the apparent insignificance of the kingdom of God should not be seen as a lack of worth. Indeed, it is worth more than everything a person may possess which is alluded to in the parables of the hidden treasure and the parable of the merchant and the pearl, later on in Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 to 46. It is worth our full commitment and loyalty, given that the kingdom's full significance and influence are still yet to come. And as comprehension of its full extent is likely beyond our grasp, Faith is required to believe that God will bring it uh, to its full consummation. But how is this relatable today? In the parable, Jesus is telling his audience, you have no idea what God is doing right now. You're expecting certain things from a kingdom, but my kingdom is, not, is like a mustard seed. It is small, it is insignificant, a tiny seed just lying there on the ground. It is not grand or impressive right now. There is no pomp and circumstance, and it's certainly not demonstrating power in the way that you think. Jesus is saying that, yes, the kingdom of God is absolutely present. It is growing under the surface, and one day, a day according to God's timing, and God's plan, you are going to witness what it's all about. But as we look at the world around us, there will be times where we think, really, Lord? If God's kingdom is present and it is advancing here on earth, it's really hard for me to see it right now. It just feels like nothing is being accomplished. I mean, life's definitely not getting any easier right now. We've only just come out of the COVID pandemic, and then a war started off in Ukraine. 
which is still going on. And let's take a look closer to home. We've all seen those interest rates shoot up and the rising cost of fuel in the weekly shop. Um, and even worse still, um, that toilet is at work is blocked again. If anyone remembers the communion from a couple of weeks ago, sorry. <laughs> um, but at least that didn't happen on a Monday um, this time. Anyway, um, we start to question, is God moving? Is God working? Am I actually having any impact for God's kingdom in the world? Yes, we can feel discouraged and frustrated. But as followers of Christ, we also believe that God's will and God's way is advancing here on earth, as it is in heaven. Like a mustard seed that hasn't come to its fullness yet, the tree is not yet in our field of view, but it is moving, it is growing, it is spreading, and there is going to be a time where we will see exactly how powerful the kingdom of God is in our world. We are all already witnesses to this change. Starting with a carpenter's son from Nazareth, a bunch of fishermen, a zealot and a tax collector from a small corner in Galilee, to the effects of the cross, the empty tomb and Christ's glorious resurrection, we are already witnesses to the kind of power that the kingdom of God has. And let's not forget the fact that for the last 2,000 years, the kingdom of God has been spreading throughout the world. Yes, the kingdom of God is both already and not yet. It is here, it is advancing, but it is not yet fully fulfilled. However, even the smallest of acts can have a big impact, not only with respect to God's kingdom, but in our lives as well. Taking work as an example, I was given this tiny little succulent by one of my colleagues. And as many of you are aware, I really don't have green fingers, so I have been trying to keep it alive at least for as long as possible. So I placed it next to the hand wash basin in my room, and every so often after washing my hands, I would cup a little bit of tiny bit of water and pop it inside the pot. And this is the outcome more than a year later. Impressive, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but in a more practical sense, um, simply spending an extra bit of time talking with my patients can greatly impact their overall experience. Taking a bit of extra time to explain results, treatments, procedures, along with their potential risks and benefits, or even just stopping and asking about how they've been going lately, respects their autonomy and builds their trust. Additionally, um, a bit of extra time taken to catch up with colleagues over lunch or at the end of a busy appointment list at the end of the day helps them to know that they are appreciated and are part of a caring and effective team. Even the little extra effort to respectfully communicate things that need following up helps prevent misunderstandings and ensures that everyone is on the same page when it comes to patient care. And so, as well as a key theme of growth, the mustard seed analogy also highlights the contrast between small, humble beginnings of the kingdom of God and the glorious, expansive nature it will ultimately attain. It serves as a reminder that God's ways are not always understood by humankind. And although the kingdom of God may appear insignificant at first, according to human standards at least, since it does not represent or embrace the kingdoms of our world, we, as followers of Christ, know that the full power of God's kingdom can only be experienced by and in a community of people who have embraced Jesus as Lord. And we wait in joyful hope for him to bring his kingdom to full purpose. The parable of the mustard seed also emphasizes the importance of faith and trust in God's plan, just as the farmer 
of Jesus' time would have planted a small seed with the expectation it would grow into a large plant, we, as believers, are encouraged to have faith and trust in God's promises, even when things seem small or insignificant. We all know that waiting for God to move and grow in our lives can be daunting. However, in this waiting, we can also know that God is working and we are being shaped by it. As we face the challenges of our daily grind here on earth, we have all on some level been made very aware that following Christ was never meant to be an easy ride, but we also know that he will make a way. Eric Raymond, the senior pastor at Redeemer Fellowship Church in Boston, summarizes this well. We have to accept that sometimes things just take longer. Other times, things never really get to where we might have hoped or prayed for. And yet still, other times, you have situations where God blesses us with unexpected growth and apparent success. We all know what it's like to work hard towards something, but not see the impact and question whether or not uh, anything significant is going to eventuate. When preparing for today's message, I was reminded of a couple of prominent figures in the Old Testament who never really, who never had the opportunity to see the promised land. So the greatest example would be Moses, um, one of the most significant and prominent figures in the Bible who led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and through the wilderness for 40 years. And also Aaron, Moses' brother, um, first high priest of Israel, who also did not see or enter the promised land. However, in looking um, for examples closer to home, let's take parenting as an example. Parents will often worry whether the values that they are instilling into their child are having any kind of an impact, especially at key ages um, when they are so impressionable. Is what I'm saying as a parent falling on deaf ears or will there be soft soil there to receive it? Or again, taking work as an example. Is this person who is asking for my advice going to listen and take action to improve their health once they leave the room? Or has all that effort gone into exploring their ideas, concerns, and then explaining and outlining a management plan gone to waste? On those days, um, we all have to be reminded that just because we don't see the immediate transformation or success or progress doesn't mean that there is a complete absence of activity. God is moving in our midst, but there are times where we will not see the impact, maybe for several months or even several years down the line. Maybe we will never find out um, in our earthly lifetime, but just as the mustard seed is something so very small, it, is, it doesn't mean your actions are not having any impact. The hiddenness of the kingdom of God effectively means that none of us really know what God is doing right now. And so, as Christians, we must always walk by faith in this life. A disciple of Christ is someone who listens and obeys. And if God has called us into something, even something that may feel small and insignificant, God may well be doing something huge under the surface, and we will have no idea. And we may never know this side of heaven. This is an important message for us as a church, especially now, in a fallen world, and in an age that longs for certainty and is always asking for proof. We are called to put our faith and trust in God, who makes all things for good. We can, therefore, have the deepest conviction in the reality of the kingdom of God, a conviction which is grounded in trust. Trust in Jesus Christ, our Savior, who is the first fruits and promise of the kingdom 
which is yet to come. Now, in the parable of the mustard seed, there are a few key points that can be drawn in relation to church and community. The first point being shelter. Mustard plants were known for providing shelter and sustenance to various creatures, including birds, that would find refuge in their branches. Just as various birds often find refuge in a tree, a thriving community should welcome people from diverse backgrounds, offering a sense of belonging to all who seek it. Support and nurturing. Just as the mustard tree just yeah, serves as a place of refuge and nourishment for the birds. Likewise, we are reminded that as a community, we should provide emotional, social, and even material support to our members in a similar way that the tiny mustard seed can flourish and grow into a tree. This support system helps each individual in the community to grow and flourish. And finally, mission and outreach. The parable can also be seen as a call to outreach and mission. Just as the mustard tree provides shelter, communities are often called to serve a purpose beyond themselves. In this way, the parable of the mustard seed affirms acts of kindness and charity and spreading these beliefs and values to others, making the church community a positive force in this world. Now, the second parable of today was the parable of the leaven, or the yeast. Jesus once again mentions the kingdom of God, referring to his domain as the Messiah. Here, a woman takes leaven uh, or yeast and mixes it into the dough. Eventually, the whole of the dough is leavened. The leaven is used to illustrate the assimilating and transformative power of the kingdom of God. And in this parable, we learn several things about the working of the kingdom in our present day. As we have already discovered in the parable of the mustard seed, that although the kingdom of God may have very small beginnings, it will certainly increase. Yeast is a tiny microscopic organism and only a little is needed into the dough. But given time, this yeast will spread throughout the whole dough in the same way Jesus' domain started with a collection of 12 men in a small corner of Galilee and has now spread throughout the world. Another point to be made is that the kingdom of God exerts its influence from within and not from without. Just as yeast uh, makes dough rise from within, God first changes the heart of a person and that internal change will then have external manifestations. However, external change alone is not enough to bring us into harmony with God. We cannot transform ourselves on our own. We simply don't have that kind of power. There has to be an outside influence on the dough, such as the leaven, in order for this process to begin. We must accept Jesus as our savior for the leavening process to begin through the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. The influence of the good news of the gospel upon culture works in a very similar way. Christians within a culture act as agents of change, slowly transforming that culture from within. We can be sure that the effect of the kingdom of God will be comprehensive. Just as the yeast works through the entirety of the dough until it is completely risen, the ultimate glory of the kingdom of God will be displayed worldwide. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk 2.12. Now, there is also a little detail in the language of verse 33 that Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 13. And looking at the ESV translation, it says, the woman took and hid the leaven in three measures of flour. And the Greek word that Jesus uses here is the word krypto. This word krypto, taken literally, means to hide or conceal. It's where we get the English word cryptic or crypt. 
And it is a hint to the audience that although the kingdom of God works invisibly, its effect will ultimately be evident to all, just as the yeast does its job slowly, secretly, and silently. But then, no one can deny its effect on the dough when the bread is baked. The same is also true in relation to the work of God's grace in our hearts. The leaven of truth works secretly, silently, and steadily to transform the soul. The natural inclinations are softened, subdued. Thoughts, feelings, motives are changed, and a new standard of character is set up in the life of Christ. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will, able, you will be able to see, test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Romans 12, 2. Now the nature of yeast is to grow and to change whatever it contacts. When we accept Christ, his grace grows in our hearts and changes us from the inside out. As the gospel transforms lives, it exerts a pervasive influence in the world at large. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 18. And so, when I started to prepare for this week's message and was given the theme and the brief, my initial thought was, how on earth am I going to prepare a sermon from just three verses in the Gospel of Matthew? But... In the same way as the mustard seed grows from a tiny kernel into a bush that covers the countryside, or a seven meter tall tree, and just as the leaven worked its way through the expanding dough, the message grew and grew. Both parables proclaim that God's action in the world, whilst almost entirely imperceptible, as the tiny mustard seed, or almost completely hidden, as the leaven in the dough, is nonetheless real and will in God's own time come to full fruition at the consummation of his kingdom. As followers of Christ, we will have to continue to accept that the kingdom of God seems insignificant to many because it does not represent nor embrace the other kingdoms of this world. But the follower of Christ also knows that the full power of the kingdom can only be experienced by and in the community of people who have embraced Jesus as Lord. And so, as I finish today, I ask each of us to contemplate how the kingdom of God is at work both in and around our lives. Thank you.